Okay, excellent. So hello, intrepid uh, students, uh, chewers of dry philosophical bones, as Keshula used to say. Um, we're going to begin with uh, some chanted prayers, or you, you know, you can mentally recite them also, or just think of the meaning. And then we're going to do a little um, meditation to set our motivation. So Doris, if you could put up those uh, initial prayers. There's the peacock feather with a drop of water on it. Okay. Okay. And if, yeah, if you can go down a little in case people are following, probably people know by now these verses. Sange churang suki chugnam la, jang chu badu dagni kepsu chi, dagi chunen gi pe sognam ki, rola penchir sange drupa shog. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened through the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, through the collections I create, through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit migrating beings. Sangye churang soki chognam la, jangchu badu dagni kepsuchi, dagi chunen gi pe sognam ki, rola penche sangye drupa shu. And then a short mandala offering. By offering this ground that I visualize, and now anointed with perfume and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and moon, visualize as a Buddha realm. May all migrators enjoy a pure realm. And this is the this is the translation that I think Laktar, Laktor used when the Dalai Lama's teachings uh, last weekend or. Uh, so, O perfect, O holy and perfect, pure Lama, from the clouds of compassion. <laughs> it's okay. Once is okay. Right there. From the clouds of compassion that form in the skies of your Dharmakaya wisdom, please release a rain of vast and profound Dharma, precisely in accordance with the needs of those to be trained. Idam guru namandala kam niryatayam he. Okay. So we're going to begin. I'm going to put up here so we can see. Uh, we're going to begin with a little um, meditation. Hi, Anna. Hi, Diana. So sit comfortably. Back straight, body relaxed, mind relaxed. Place your attention on the breathing, the respiration, by recognizing an inhalation as different than an exhalation. Place your mindfulness about, uh, upon the breathing, let go of other thoughts.
as we've said many times, at the endpoints where the breath is not moving in or out, just for an instant, it's where the mind has the chance of wandering, try to keep your mind stabilized there. Recognize when you're making a long breath or a short breath, whether it be inhalation or exhalation. Even here, we're letting go of our attention to the eyesight, to that which we hear, that which our body feels, say itches or whatever. Of course, smell and taste, but they are perhaps less obvious and obvious now. with the mind slightly calmed. Now turn your attention to the mental consciousness. Let go of your attention to the breathing, your mindfulness of the breathing. First, recognize the mental consciousness before you have mindfulness of it. And the way you do that is by recognizing the contents because the Mental consciousness itself is something which is very, very sheer, very subtle. Recognizing the contents of thoughts, memories of the past, maybe just a few moments ago, maybe a long time ago, observations about the present, thoughts about the future, emotional states. Presence of afflictions. Or virtuous states of mind. Notice all of this content of the mind. Think of it as according to the suggestion of the great Mahasiddhas that talked about the Mahamudra. Think of them as almost like clouds within an otherwise clear sky of your mind. And defocus on the thoughts, depriving them of any mental attention, any energy that might be focused on them. Just focus on the clear light nature between them especially the fact that it is, it offers no obstruction to the entry or reabsorption of thoughts back into the consciousness.
this conventional nature of the mind, its conventional clear light nature, has been present in every mind that we have had since beginning this time. Different mind, different, for instance, when we were animals or humans in other lives during that period of time, we had a mental consciousness appropriate to that level. Say if we had an animal mind or a preta mind or a hell being mind or a human mind, those gross minds absorbed at the time of death. But while they were existent, they all had this same clear light nature that we have now. We call it the developmental Buddha nature. And observing observing it recognizing it we can feel some joy that we can develop all the good qualities eliminate all the faults in our mind in this in a, in a radical way that the buddha proposed that can lead us to a state in which we have no suffering, fears at all. That we are constantly blissful, which is not even conceived of in the Western world of psychology. First, possibility of liberation from cyclic existence where we have no problems, no mental problems. Further state of enlightenment where we have optimized our own aim, having not only no problems, but constant blissful consciousness. But in terms of our, in terms of the aims of others, our achieving liberation allows a certain amount of benefit to sentient beings to kind of quote President Nixon when he left office and he told the reporters, now you don't have me to kick around anymore. You know, when we reach nirvana, we no longer take rebirth. Sentient beings will no longer interact with us, developing envy or jealousy or anger or attachment or pride or anything else. But the Bodhisattva, who is actively engaged from life to life to benefit sentient beings, has a much more direct impact on sentient beings. The Bodhisattva, in meeting sentient beings, creating karmic connections with them, leads them out of problems, gives teachings, guides them. All these other sentient beings who have been our mother numberless times in the past, since beginningless time, while we were struggling within cyclic existence in the six realms, we've never escaped from cyclic existence till now we've risen to the heights of bliss in the in the higher realms we've remained despondent in the lower realms with unbearable suffering and hardship under the control of others as have all sentient beings who have been our mothers now, taking cognizance of that, recognizing with this auspicious moment, life of leisure and endowment, we can make some change in that situation. We can actually benefit ourselves and others in the greatest way by achieving enlightenment. to re realizing emptiness, to accumulating merit, which are the causes of the 
Dharmakaya and the Rupakaya, the, the two bodies of the Buddha, if you divide into two. In order to, to accumulate merit and accumulate wisdom, we need to know how, which are explained in Chandrakirti's great text, the entry into the middle way, the Majamakavatara, and especially elucidated, illuminated by Lama Tsongkhapa in his Gompa Rap cell, the illuminating, illuminating the intention which we are studying. So think, I'm going to participate today listening, contemplating, meditating in order to accumulate the two collections so that I eventually can become a Buddha by progressing on the Buddhist path for the welfare of sentient beings and myself, incidentally, myself not is the major component of that equation. But knowing that when we do achieve enlightenment, we reach the optimal benefit of oneself and the optimal benefit for sentient beings. I'm going to participate in order to become a Buddha, to remove sentient beings from suffering, entirely and place them in everlasting blissful happiness. That's the reason I'm going to be participating today. And then bring your attention back to the present. Good to see you all. Ida, Diana, Anna, and an anonymous iPhone. <laughs> Not sure who exactly that is. Um, so uh, before we begin, does anyone have any um, Dharma question? Any Dharma, what do you call it? Dharma itch that you need scratched? Anything from the previous class that was left unresolved or reading that you did in preparation for today's class? Anyone? Everyone okay? Okay. That's good. Good to see also Rocio is here coming on. Hi, Rocio. Uh, so I'm going to begin... You know, in our in our first class last time, uh, I gave a, a quotation from the uh, the pacha, which mean, pa means father, shu means you know usually means dharma, but we say teachings the the father teachings um, that attributed to Atisha from the book of Kadam <clears throat> about. The, uh, our situation being like a passenger in a boat. If you have a good oarsman and a, and a, or captain, and you have a good boat, uh, you can uh, get to the secure location of uh, you know liberation or enlightenment. So uh, that was a quotation Geshe gave. And the next day, in that that was two thousand and two, July two thousand and two. Uh, the July 1st, he gave another quotation from that same text. Uh, it must have been that that was a weekend. That's because the last class, I think the quotation was from the 28th or something like that, or June. Uh, so on July 1st, 2002, Geshele quoted again from that text by Atisha. And I wanted to, to uh, mention that also uh, kind of as a motivation to begin with. So this actually turns out to be the verse just before the verse that we talked about last class. So uh, I'll say it in Tibetan just for auspiciousness first. Dopa dargi sinbu da, 
That means like Sindhu means worm and dar means silk. So the so desire is like the silkworm. Rangla Jungwe Kachuyi. So uh Rangla Jungwa, Rangjung means kind of naturally uh, arising. Kachu means what do we say? Kachu kind of like spittle or that which comes out of the mouth, due to the that which comes out of the silkworm's mouth. Um Rangni Chingne Dromiter. Uh, it binds itself uh, in such a way that it does not permit movement. Dejin dagzin chempole. Dejin means in the same way dagzin means, as you probably recall, <clears throat> self grasping, grasping to a self of, of persons or a self of phenomena. <clears throat> chempoe, it means it's great. <clears throat> dagzin, due to, out of that. Likewise, from the great self-grasping or the extreme self-grasping, Jungwe Damsap Chemboi. Damsap means kind of a mud, muddy area or cesspool or what would you call it, you know, cistern. <laughs> I remember from the from the Bible, there's some some quotation. <clears throat> the people who were adherents of urine therapy quoted, you should drink the waters of thine own cistern. <laughs> so anyway, likewise, the uh, great, great muddy cesspool that arises from, from extreme self-grasping does not allow one to a secure state. The same kind of sense of, of that we talked about last time, uh, sensar, um, you know, a secure state means a place where you don't have to worry. You're not in transit, like in the boat, in the ocean, you've reached dry land, or here, in this case, talking about liberation or enlightenment. Uh, because of that great uh, cesspool that arises from extreme self-grasping, uh, it doesn't allow one to reach a secure state of liberation or enlightenment. Miso Shindu. Kurdu Juk Nangring Damle Ze Changi Chikyang Mipen Choma Choma Chona So that, that last part means while unbearable uh, entering into uh, the cocoon, or it, it could, as Tupton Jimpa translates it in his translation of that, into a corpse. The forbearing by holding up from the great mud, there is no benefit at all. It is good to escape. So this is kind of talking about the fact that uh, you know, this situation that we find ourselves, like the silkworm that uh, is, creates a cocoon around itself from the liquid that arises naturally from its mouth. We're caught up out of desire into you know, fascination with the events of this lifetime alone. Uh, simply to, you know, move from one side or another in the cocoon to sort of uh, uh, just move around a little bit uh, doesn't really benefit at all. It is, it is good to escape. So there's, there's a lot more commentary on that, but I won't, I won't go into that right now. Um, but uh, just to mention as a, as a motiva motivation, when we talk about uh, emptiness, Lama Zopa Rinpoche would mention that uh, it's important uh, to have both scriptural sources of emptiness and reasoning. And, and in the same way, in the Lam Rim, which uh, some of you are still studying, uh, in actively, I'm not say still studying, not as in a pejorative sense. This is sort of like the main subject we should be studying the stages of the path. Um, also, there, not just talking about emptiness, you need to have scriptural sources like this, verses by great beings. This was 
something that came from the holy mouth of Drondemba, uh, who in the Kadam, the book of Kadam, at some points is just called Broom, B H R U M. Tutin Jimpa, in his footnotes to his translation of that verse, uh, mentioned that uh, it, it appeared that at some point, Drondempa, uh, his body disappeared and he was replaced by what appeared to be just the syllable broom. So there was, it, it was called broom, not B-R-O-O-M, but the, the Sanskrit syllable broom. So this, this verse kind of is a scriptural source for us to think about. You know, the examples that I've mentioned before about us being caught in cyclic existence, the two great ones are that we're caught in a great ocean, you know, waves uh, impelling us and dangerous sea monsters coming that can cause uh, causes of suffering and fear. And the other example is being caught in a prison, like a prison camp or concentration camp. Um, or in this case, a cocoon that the, the cocoon or the prison that we're we're caught in that doesn't allow us to get to a secure state is a result of our result of our own doing, like the like the liquid that's coming out of the the silkworm's mouth that causes its cocoon. So we should think to what's it called? Is it called chrysalis? What is it called when the when the uh, butterfly or the uh, the insect leaves the cocoon. Is that what is that what it's called when it transforms from a, a worm? Does anyone anyone know? Suvansh, do you know what I'm talking about? Pupil stage. Pupil stage. That's the stage of the silkworm, right? Butterflies it, come from the chrysalis and moths. Chrysalis is when it becomes butterflies and chrysalis and moths and cocoons. Right. So we should think like that. We should it's it's no good to remain in the cocoon. It's no law. It's not and not good. Just sort of augmenting things within cyclic existence. You know, just getting everything arranged here or that or moving around in the cocoon. It's 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 going to be the same state. We should escape. We should leave cyclic existence. We should leave this cocoon that we're in, and fly, soar like the butterfly. Okay, that's what I wanted to share with you today. So, I find those I find these kinds of analogies by the great masters, Drondempa in this case, and Atisha and so forth, to be you know things that they themselves uh, see analogous <clears throat> to our situation and to the situation that we can find ourselves in, to be uh, very very useful. Okay, so we're on the sixth mind generation in this text, uh, which you could call the sixth chapter, uh, you could call the sixth bumi, or you could call the sixth, sixth perfection, the perfection of wisdom or the wisdom gone beyond. Um, so we, we began last time explaining the sixth ground with the four main uh, divisions. And we talked about the etymology of the name of the ground and its superiority. Um, and we we mentioned the first verse on uh, the directly facing, it, it could be called, uh, the Abhimuki. Or on approaching, say for instance, Tupin Chimpa translated that on directly facing, he, meaning the Bodhisattva, abides in the mind of meditative equipoise or his aim uh, and turns to the attributes of perfect Buddhahood. And Klein's translation said, approaching the qualities of a perfect Buddha and seeing the suchness of dependent arising, of, of arising dependent upon this. That's the verse that. Stephen was talking about the, the, the phrase that Stephen was talking about before. In Tibetan, we say, Keni Dipe Deni, or 
idam means this, right? Like we say, idam guru ratna mandala kam niryatayami. Pratyaya tattva. Tattva. So, uh, arising, the suchness of arising dependent upon this due to which they abide in wisdom on the manifest abiding in equipoise they attain cessation so we talked about that having attained the fifth ground a thoroughly perfect uh, a thoroughly pure perfection of meditative absorption the bodhisattva abides in the most excellent mind of meditative equipoise of the sixth ground reading Jimpa's translation namely directly facing or or the manifest. So there's many, as, as Geshe Zopa said in his commentary back in 2002, many, many ways of explaining why it's called Abhimukhi or called uh, the manifest. Um, you could say directly facing the qualities of enlightenment or approaching them or manifesting them. So we talked we, we talked about that. We talked about um, this ground is called the manifest for three reasons because here on the basis of uh, superiority and wisdom, the reflection like ultimate nature of things becomes manifest. And we investigated a little bit about what that meant. Uh, the reflection like ultimate nature of things. We said that in one sense, the ultimate nature of things is reflection-like in that uh, when you see a reflection and you have wisdom that knows it is empty of being yourself, say if you're you're looking in the mirror, looking at your face, you're, or in this case, if you're looking at your image on the Zoom screen, <laughs> you, maybe, maybe it's centered here on me. I don't know. I, I put it in gallery view if you'd like to see the gallery view, you may be able to see that the other students, um, you know, that's not you, but it looks like you, right? Uh, second reason why it's called the manifest, because on the fifth ground, the Bodhisattva uh, took the true paths as their object. Let's see here. What did Anne say here? Uh, on the fifth ground, they observed true paths, and she had in parentheses, and thus have newly gained complete wisdom with respect to the four truths. So on the fifth ground, they, they took true paths as their object, but here now they have the special wisdom of uh, the a new, a new uh, completed version of that. And third reason, because the Bodhisattva now turns to the attributes or approaches the attributes of perfect Buddhahood. These are all why it's called the manifest or approaching. And we gave the uh, little explanation of what Jayananda's commentary and in Tupin's Jimpa's text, he calls the explanation of the commentary. So in that title, commentary means Chandrakirti's auto-commentary and explanation means Jayananda's explanation of that commentary, right? So sort of like commentary on a commentary. And then we mentioned how uh, at the end of that uh, paragraph there, it says, the first reason above and, and says, which states that the reflection-like nature of phenomena, the emptiness of inherent existence, which itself which is itself like a reflection in that it exists, but is not truly established. The emptiness of inherent existence exists. It, it is a, an existent. It's not something which cannot be perceived. The first reason indicates how the wisdom versed in the sequential and reverse order of the 12 links of dependent origination come to full realization here on this sixth ground. Thus, the meaning here is that on the basis of full realization of these two trainings in wisdom, two trainings in 
the Four Noble Truths and on the Twelve Links. And you remember we, we mentioned earlier in the course, uh, the Shravakas usually take the Four Noble Truths as their main object of meditation. And the Pratika Buddhas take the Twelve Links, which is in a sense more sophisticated. Here, even in this sequence, the Four Noble Truths were first understood the subtle and gross 16 aspects in a, in a very profound way on the fifth Bhumi. But here on the sixth, the, the Bodhisattva also understands the, the 12 links. So it's indicating that it's a more subtle understanding. Uh, the, thus, the meaning here is that on the basis of full realization of these two trainings in wisdom, trainings in the Four Noble Truths and Dependent Origination have come to be manifestly known by the Bodhisattva. So the next paragraph is where we ended last time that we didn't give commentary on. Since the three trainings in wisdom, and Jimpa says, illusion-like reality, the Four Noble Truths, and the Twelve Links of Dependent Origination are the three, whereas Anne says, How does she say? So she says, thus on this ground, the bodhisattvas complete the three trainings in wisdom. So when we say trainings, usually remember we talk about the three trainings, meaning the training in morality, the training in concentration, and the training in wisdom, right? So even among wisdom, there are three trainings that are, are being talked about here. So she puts in parentheses, uh, so she translates uh, what Jimpa translated there. Uh, Jimpa said, since the three trainings in wisdom, illusion-like reality, the four noble truths, and the 12 links, she says, uh, thus, thus on this ground, they complete the three trainings in wisdom. And then she parenthetically says, uh, that is skill regarding emptiness, whereas Jimpa said illusion like reality, the four truths and dependent arising. It's a slightly different emphasis on the first one. Here she said uh, skill in regarding emptiness. Jimpa said the illusion like reality. Uh, Geshe Zopa, when he commented on that, gave just Different. He said the three refer to the wisdom that realizes <clears throat> the 37 wings of enlightenment, the 37 bodhipaksha, the 30, 37 factors that lead to enlightenment that we had on the, the fourth bhumi, uh, the, the wisdom that realizes the subtle and gross aspects of the Four Noble Truths on the fifth bhumi, and the um, here the wisdom of the, of the 12 links forward in reverse orders. So slightly different between the three, Geshe, Geshe Zopa. Uh, in other words, as he had said also, there were many ways of explaining why it's called the manifest, the sixth ground, or Abhimukhi, approaching or facing. Uh, there are many ways of explaining what these three trainings are here. Anyway, so Jimpa says, since the three trainings in wisdom are fully realized on this ground, ground, given that the more distinctly superior one's tranquility, given that the more distinctly superior one's own tranquility is, the more distinctly superior will be one's insight. And we, we mentioned that several times before. Remember when we talked about Um, you know, when you talk about morality acts as the basis to develop concentration perfectly, and concentration acts as the basis to develop wisdom perfectly, because you can't, even if you have wisdom uh, that's flickering because you don't have the concentration, it can't be brought to perfection. So here it's kind of talking about that, given that the more distinctly one, one's own tranquility is, 
the more distinctly superior will be one's insight. And given how on the fifth ground, the Bodhisattva attained the most excellent perfection of meditative absorption or concentration. So here on the sixth ground, the perfection of wisdom comes to be most excellent. Okay. How are we doing? Is it making sense? Oh, Daniel has, has appeared. Hi, Daniel. Good to see you. You were able to get in. Hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> so we have Switzerland and Germany and uh, a couple of other countries involved here. So uh, the text, Jimpa's text, therefore, continues, says, therefore, it is from this ground onward that the special form of absorption into cessation is obtained. As, as uh, Anne says, therefore, an uncommon absorption in cessation, that is, a, and she puts in parentheses, that is a wisdom consciousness directly realizing emptiness within the context of the cessation of gross discrimination and feeling, and, and ending her parenthetical remark, is attained from this ground. So we were talking about this Gokpa Nyongjuk. So this is, uh, or cessational absorption. So I mentioned last time, um, and, and previously it came up in our course, um, this is not the ordinary cessational absorption of the Hinayana. It is a cessational absorption that uses the subtle mental consciousness of the fourth formless absorption. Remember, there are four form absorptions or four form realm states of subtly more subtle minds. And then there's the formless realm where the mental states are becoming more and more subtle till the very, the, the top of those is called, uh, one of the nicknames of it is Tsitse, the peak of, of, of cyclic existence, the peak of existence within you know, within cyclic existence, the subtle most mind. So it's very, very subtle, and it's not usually used to meditate on emptiness other than as a training. <laughs> uh, uh, usually the bodhisattvas don't use that, you know, to first realize emptiness, that, that subtle most state, but uh, they do use it as a, a method of training their mind to, to be able to enter into a re direct realization of emptiness with that subtle most mind of the peak of cyclic existence uh, and to have a cessation of all the ordinary appearances. Although Anne's uh, parenthetical notes uh, said there, where did it say? Within the context of the cessation of course, discrimination and feeling, that's just, that's part of the experience of the peak of cyclic existence. It's not, not talking about the cessational absorption that the Hinayana reveres uh, in which uh, one is almost, almost like dead. So it, it, here the cessation is emphasizing that it's a cessation, cessation of the uh, all of the gross perceptions of conventional reality. Okay, so Shimba said, therefore, it is from this ground onward that the special form of absorption into cessation is obtained. Then he quotes, Lama Sokopa quotes, the precious garland. Uh, Nargajuna's Ratnavali. And I think this is quoted by Chandrakirti also. It's not, not just that Lama Sunkapa quotes. So Jimpa translates this verse, the sixth, because this is in the sequence of verses in uh, the Precious Garland talking about the various Bhumi. So it's understood that the word Bhumi is attached here. The sixth Bhumi is called directly facing, or uh, as Anne says, the approaching, right? You're getting, you're facing these qualities or approaching them for it directly faces the Buddha's attributes, or Anne says they are approaching the qualities of a Buddha. 
through familiarity with tranquility and insight, familiarity with calm abiding and special insight, one flourishes with the attainment of cessation. And says they attain cessation and hence are advanced in wisdom. Then the second verse talking about the six bumi and Ratnavali and the precious garland. As for its fruitional effect or its maturation effect, remember when we talked about effects, uh, we, we talked about the various kinds of effects. Um, maturation effect. Well, let me just ask. Richard, do you remember the four kinds of effects of a of a karmic action? We've said so many times, it's, but probably a lot. Some of you haven't categorized it. Um, I remember that we talked about it. I don't remember the details. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. You don't have to be sorry. <laughs> uh, who who can who can explain the four effects? Rocio, Rocio wants to. Okay. Well, I know two of them. One is the same as the action, and the other one is the environment. Okay, it's close. Okay. It's close. So, generally, we say we could we could put uh, the environmental effect as one of them. It could be the first, it could be the last. That means the the environment uh, that you find yourself in, not just environment like as a human or, or something like that but the environment within your realm uh, you might might live in delhi or in calcutta or let's say what's the famous place uh what's the famous place bollywood what is that bengal uh, what, what where is bollywood what is that in india Sumbash. uh bombay bombay that's what i was looking for bombay it used to be called bombay now they call it something else i think Right? What's it? What's it called now in in India? Sumbash. Uh, I don't know, Venerable George. Oh, okay. Anyway, I think they've changed the names of a lot of the cities. So Mumbai, Mumbai, Mumbai. Yeah, it's called Mumbai. Uh, so um, you could be in a you know estate in Mumbai, or you could be in the the barrio or the you know the 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 terrible places where people live with tin roofs and and uh, or you could be living it out in the slums completely open to the air um so that that depends that's kind of your environmental effect of your karma you could be born in a muddy place or or so forth uh a dry place so that's one of the effects what are the other three effects uh, one of them is called the maturation effect. That's the effect that throws you into one of the realms of samsara. And then the other two are usually subsumed into one. They, they say the effect that's similar to the cause. So one of them is the, if, if you divide effects similar to the cause into two, they say the effects similar to the cause as an experience. So that means if you killed before, the ripening of that means that you could be uh, killed or have your life shortened or your medicine less effective and so forth. And the effects similar to the cause as an action means that you have the habitual tendency to kill again. So we, we talk about these four kinds of causes, uh, four kinds of results. The environmental results, the maturation results, the results similar to the cause as an experience, the results similar to the cause as an action. You should memorize those somehow. So here it says, as for its fruitional effect or the maturation effect, one will be the king of the pranin, pranir mana gods, or as uh, Anne says, a king of the gods in the land enjoying uh, emanation. Since he is not outshone by the Shravakas, he pacifies those with inflated pride. So what is this talking about? Does anyone know? 
What what are the uh, where are the gods enjoying uh, emanation? John, do you know? Have you studied? Have you done? I haven't really studied. I guess uh, there are gods in the form and the formless realms. I think. Is that right? So. Um, Don't I have the note here? Did I get to the wrong? I, I put on the wrong note here. Oh, here we go. So there are six types of desire realm gods. So these are not the form realm gods. So um, we mentioned uh, before uh, the four guardian kings. Have you heard of them, the four guardians? So when you go when when you're in the desire realm, the first of the desire realm gods, you're still in the desire realm. You're not talking about the form realm gods like Brahma and so forth. You're talking about the desire realm gods. The first of them is called the uh, Katur Maharaja Kayeka, the four guardian uh, kings or that ki that kingdom. So there's a there's a like for instance. In the southern continent, the guardian king is Vaisravana, who is also revered as in Tantra and so forth as as the uh, well, you know wealth uh, one of the wealth gods, right? Um, wealth deities. Vaisravana is calling is, is holding a mongoose, which is doing what? Does anyone know? He's vomiting jewels. <laughs> vomiting jewels, right? So, so if you try to get my dogs to do it, then they just won't. The, yeah, the, yeah, would be nice. So, if you deep dive into uh, this analogy, there are all sorts of uh, explanations how that imagery has come about of a mongoose that's vomiting jewels. Uh, some people say that some of the Mongol kings on Earth. Uh, had stuffed mongooses within which they stored their jewels. Anyway, but anyway, uh, so the the first level is the the level of the four kings. That's sort of near, not not near the peak of Mount Meru, but above the the four continents. Um, then there's the heaven of thirty three, which is on the summit summit of Mount Meru, uh, where Indra presides. So of the desire realm gods, there are two of them that are still uh, sort of, uh, how, how to say, uh, have their, have some kind of stability. They're on Mount Meru. The four, the four kings, the guardian kings around the four directions, uh, that realm with other beings, of course, not just those gods. And then on the summit is uh, the heaven of 33, where um, Shakyamuni's mother had been born uh, after she passed away at his birth and where he went up to at one point in one uh, rainy season to teach her the Abhidharma. Uh, that's, and then he, when he came down, that's called the, the descent, uh, one of the, the major Buddhist holidays when the Buddha descended from the heaven of 33. Some people say descended from Tushita. That's not right. Descended from the heaven of 33. So you know what that is. Then there comes, above the summit of Mount Meru, comes four other god realms, the first of which is called Yama, uh, sim similar to, like we say, the, the Yama, the king of the gods, but with a different uh, vowel, uh, long A, or, or in Tibetan, we say tapdel, free of um, conflict. Uh, that means they are uh, free of battle or conflict with the asuras. Uh, they are in this. So this this realm is in the sky above um, Mount Meru, and then above that, Ganden or Tushita. Remember when we said the Tushita gods. The Tushita God realm is in the desire realm above Mount Meru, the second one. Um, the Tushita gods, um, they have uh, great enjoyments. 
it sort of like it's a suburb is where you will find the Toshida pure realm where Maitreya presently presides. Um, so that's that's also above, so that's above Mount Meru in the sky above Mount Meru. Then comes uh Raptu or Sunirmata. Uh that's the realm that we're talking about here. So this is what what uh what did Jimpa say here? He did he put it down there? It, uh Pranirmana refers to the Nirmanarati. That's in a note just after that verse. So what that's what's that's talking about is that these are called Raptul. Rab means the Su in the in the one of the names, or uh, the uh, those who can. Tr oh, sorry, uh, or or the near the Nirmana. Rati, those who experience sexual pleasure by smiling. So that's the that's the realm that these um, sixth realm bodhisattvas can take birth as the king of that land. So there's a little bit reminiscent of the of the of the tantras when we talk about the kriya, charya, yoga, and anuttara yoga tantras. We say that the the Kriya Tantra deities experience their sexual uh, sexual bliss by smiling, you know, kind of like kids in in school, right? Uh, you know, flirting, you know, smiling or showing some affect to another, they experience pleasure. And in the the Charya Tantra, uh, they experience pleasure by holding hands. In the yoga chara by embracing, and in the maha anatara by engaging in sexual intercourse. So, sort of different levels, a little bit reminiscent of that. So, this is this uh, su nirmata or the nirma nirmanarati who experience sexual pleasure by smiling. That's where these six. Bhumi bodhisattvas uh, have the karma to be reborn as the king of that. Above that is the final uh, highest realm of the desire realm gods uh, that's called control, controlling the emanation of others. Shentru Wangshe. Uh, these are the tallest of the of the gods and the longest lives, longest lived or lived. Uh, and they are all, that's also the location where, when we talk about the four Maras, the son of uh, Deva, Deva Putra Mara, remember one of the Maras, actual physical being, that's where the Deva Putra Mara lives in the top of samsara, in the top of uh, that sixth desire realm, God realm. Make sense? Diana, what do you think? Diana, what did you think? You following? You okay? You can pre press your space bar if you're if you're on a computer. That's a shortcut. To yeah, I'm having some technical difficulties today, so my computer okay, keeps no problem, freezing. no problem. Okay, so that that's worth knowing about that there are six uh, desire realm gods. So then the next outline comes: uh, praise. To the perfection of wisdom. Uh, this is not the usual word for praise. This is the Tibetan word ngakpa, which kind of means like, you know, really even greater than praise, you know, something very substantial. Um, Jimpa translates to demonstrate that the collections other than the perfection of wisdom, such as generosity, depend on the perfection of wisdom to traverse the resultant ground, the following is stated, the second verse is stated, or as Anne says, to indicate that the collections of giving and so forth, which are other than wisdom, progress to the ground that is the fruit, namely the Buddhahood, independence on the perfection of wisdom. Chandrakirti's uh, karakas say, 
just as a single man, reading Jimpa, just as a single man with eyes can easily lead a group of blind men to their desired destination, here too, intelligence leads the sightless virtues and guides them to the conqueror's state. Does that make sense? Blind, say, if you have um, a group of blind, they don't have to be men, a group of blind people, <laughs> uh, they are kind of uh, difficult, you know, right? I mean, you know, nowadays we have walking sticks and we have the ability to go to intersections where the stoplights have beepers and so forth and so on. Um, but generally, blind people can't get to where they want to go, right? Because they can't see. But uh, what, amongst in in that group, if there's someone with eyes who can see, they can that person with eyes can lead them to their destination. So the the idea is that uh, the other perfections by themselves, the perfection of generosity morality, patience, enthusiastic perseverance and concentration just by themselves are kind of like the blind people. They can't get you to enlightenment by themselves. But with adding to that group, uh, the person who can see, see reality, in this case, the perfection of wisdom, that can lead them to the conqueror state. Or as Anne translates that, just as a person having eyes, easily leads all in a blind group to their desired destinations, a destination. So here, also the mind of wisdom, taking hold of virtues that lack the eye of wisdom, goes to the state of a conqueror. Making sense? Suvansh, what do you think? Make sense? So you're looking off the side. So you have a screen where the text is off to your, a little to your left there, right? Uh, yes, Venerable George, I have two screens because I've got to show text on one and I, then I see right, the, right. Maybe on the I other. I do the same. Yeah, I've got I've got three screens here. I've got iPad over here with Anne's text and iPad over here with Jimpa's text. And then I'm looking at you here, over here. Okay. Making sense? Daniel, does that make sense? Blind people can't get to their, where they want to go. They need to rely on someone with eyesight. Daniel? You can't unmute? Okay, it doesn't matter. I'm not sure if you, you, you seem to realize I was talking to you. Richard, what do you, what, you have your hand up. What do you think? Uh, yes, um, I'm just uh, not clear on the phrase sightless virtues. So that means uh, the these other virtues, like just by itself, perfection of wisdom, uh, perfection of generosity. You might think, oh, if you have generosity, that can lead you to enlightenment. Just by itself, uh, that can't lead you to enlightenment. It has to be accompanied by and, and all of the perfections when actually practiced have to be accompanied by the perfection of wisdom in order for them to be a, a practice of that perfection. So these other virtues, such as generosity, not talking about the perfection of generosity, which already implies it is uh, conjoined with the wisdom of emptiness, just generosity, the practice of generosity, the virtue of generosity itself can't bring you to enlightenment. Reminiscent in the in the verses, the glance meditations on the Lan Rim, when we say um, recognizing that wishing Buddha, uh, sorry, it just just by bodhicitta alone, I cannot achieve enlightenment. Even if I have engaging bodhicitta, uh, I have to have the wisdom that realizes emptiness. Does that make it more clear, Richard? Yes, much clearer. Thank you. Yes, and that's sightless. So, Daniel, did, did you get a way to unmute there? If you uh, if you press your space bar, you can unmute. There you go. Are you, yeah. 
Yeah, I understood. I have a question. I mean, yeah, the way, you, the way you're explaining it right now, actually, generosity and morality could be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, they could be dangerous if they're not led by wisdom or consciousness. Well, yeah, we, we, here we mean the wisdom of emptiness, not just general wisdom. So say, for instance, yeah. um, if you create uh, <laughs> with a good motivation, you create generosity or create gener you You are generous. You give. <laughs> create generosity sounds philosophical. You, you're generous. You give. Um, you create the karma to experience and affect similar to the cause as an experience so in the future, you will receive uh, goods, resources, and so forth. Like the famous verse uh, in another place in, in Nargajuna's Precious Garland, he says, uh, as a result of charity or giving, there are resources. As a result of morality, there is high status. So that means the results similar to the causes and experience. Uh, or in, also in, in the case of morality, it can mean the maturation result. Uh, high status means as a result of being moral, the karmic result of that is to be born in high status. That means in the upper realms, not in the lower realms. So it could be dangerous if you don't have a good motivation. If you give for instance, out of desire to have your name put on the, you know, you give a wing of the medical school, you finance it to have your name, you know, the the Daniel Rohr uh, Cancer Ward or something like that, or something like that, or George Chernoff uh, School of Engineering or something like that. Then if you're doing that out of pride, that, that doesn't, you will have some beneficial result because it is a virtuous action but it can be mixed with some bad results also uh so you have to be careful that way you have to have that kind of wisdom but uh generally creating virtuous karma doesn't usually have a downside what downside do you see in creating virtuous karma in being generous or being moral you said you said it was dangerous if you didn't have wisdom. well a negative effect. I mean that. Well, like you said, if basically if you're just like acting out morality or generosity, behaving like to so other people admire you or respect you, right? That's what I actually mean. Right. Yeah. So that you're you're right. Right in that respect. Okay. So this is a famous verse. Uh, Reminiscent also a little bit, you know, if you remember the, the analogy you find in various places of the blind men uh, encountering an elephant and one person who has their hands on the legs. So it's like a pillar and another who has the hands on the trunks. So, oh, it's like a, a hose. I can't remember what the other ones. Do, do anyone know that analogy? Karen, do you know that? You're nodding a little subliminally there. Yes, but I couldn't tell you what what they all feel and say it is. But yes, I do know that one. Okay. Does anyone know the, the the rest of those? Okay, you can investigate. So there, that comes also in the Prajna Paramita at another place. So a little bit reminiscent like that. Uh, you know, you can't really uh, tell, let's say, even ascertain without eyesight. Uh, you can't even ascertain that there's an elephant. You only see some aspect of it. So a little bit connected with this. So Jimpa's um, translation of Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary to that verse says, just as, for example, a single man, single person, generally in Tibetan, when the word me, you can translate it as man, or you could just call it, call it person, human, you know, just as a single human with eyes can easily lead a, gr a group of, of blind people to their desired destination. Likewise, here too, also in this context, in the context of the path, intelligence, it means wisdom, 
namely the perfection of wisdom, leads or, in other words, thoroughly sustains the virtues such as generosity that are in themselves sightless in relation to su suchness. They themselves, if you just talk about the virtue of generosity, you don't talk about the perfection of generosity, it is sightless with respect to uh, emptiness, right? It doesn't see emptiness. If you talk about the perfection of generosity, it's implied that they're always practiced in conjunction with wisdom. So even if it's a practice of the perfection of generosity, that would be conjoined with wisdom. Ida, what do you, what do you think? Thank you, Venerable. Uh, well, the mind of wisdom realizes emptiness. Can, what about the mind of compassion? Does compassion realize emptiness? Oh, okay. Or does it have to be conjoined with the mind of wisdom? Right. So, uh, mm. so, Compassion itself, what does compassion understand? Uh, you know, it's a consciousness, it understands something. It's a consciousness that um, is aiming, has a desire, is coincident with the desire to achieve enlightenment, which is always, that's sort of like the deciding factor. It's always present, that desire to achieve enlightenment and it's coincident with a causal desire to bring about the benefit of sentient beings. So one can have bodhicitta without having wisdom, right? Say, for instance, those practitioners of lower faculties, that means they're uh, especially the faculty of wisdom is not as sharp. They develop bodhicitta, uh, even engaging bodhicitta, through the practice of, of the seven causes and effects, uh, they they have uh, they they can create bodhicitta. They engage in the bodhisattva's activities, uh, and they may have as aspiration to realize emptiness. But if they haven't realized emptiness, bodhicitta itself is one of those virtues which, by itself, is sightless. So it also has to be conjoined with wisdom. Remember when we talked about the other way of developing bodhicitta, other than the seven methods of cause and effect, uh, we talk about the equalizing exchange and exchanging self and others. That's more appropriate for those of higher faculty of wisdom who can realize emptiness first and then more easily understand how they can exchange themselves with others because there's no inherently existent self you know, I don't inherently exist uh, the way that I think, even in this body. I could actually identify myself with the entirety of sentient beings. And so when they suffer, I, I feel aggrieved, right? I feel, uh, you know, the need to alleviate that suffering of other sentient beings. So that, that kind of uh, development of bodhicitta, which is conjoined with wisdom uh, would fulfill this because it it, it is it, it it compassion itself doesn't realize emptiness but it can be conjoined with wisdom. Sumanch. Uh, yes, uh, venerable George, I just wanted to uh, point out that when I read this verse, it it um, it it brings up a point of difference between how you see. Um, um, compassion and such practices uh, being done in other traditions versus how the Buddhists say uh, they you you should do it. Uh, when when you know you know when I see my relatives you know who 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 practice in another tradition, um, they have a very strong sense of compassion, and that will you know that will manifest and they will talk about it etc. But they will never bring that and conjoin it with wisdom which is what is being um, uh, which is what uh, the way over here is uh, and and you know th that th that's a very big point of difference i i find right between between the traditions 
Right. So your relatives, if you don't mind me asking, are Hindu, Jain, what what, what are what H Hindus, Hindus? Hindus. Hindus, right. So uh, they may, uh, other traditions also, even Christianity, when they talk about compassion or something similar to bodhicitta, uh, let's say especially compassion, they may say that there needs to be some wisdom, but they don't, they're not talking about the wisdom necessarily of emptiness. They may be talking about the wisdom uh, that realizes that if you give alcohol to an alcoholic, if you're generous and say, ah, oh, come on, have some, uh, that that's not wise. Uh, they may conjoin it that way, but they don't necessarily conjoin it with the wisdom that realizes emptiness. So what would that mean? Realizing that you yourself as the donor, as the giver, as the, the generous one is empty of inherent existence, that the uh, object being donated uh, doesn't inherently exist uh, so that you don't develop pride or whatever. And uh, realizing that the recipient is empty of inherent existence. And even going beyond that, the, the action of giving, uh, you know, taking this and transferring it over there, that's just a process that doesn't inherently exist. So though those factors being lacking, uh, that virtuous karma itself uh easily destroyed by anger in the future and that that virtuous self is not called a transcendental virtuous karma that is just a mundane virtuous karma okay okay so uh let's go on so um so in jimpa's text following that uh lama sokapa says for it is through the perfection of wisdom that one sees without distortion what is a right path and what is not. And says, for the perfection of wisdom unerringly perceives correct and incorrect paths. So I mentioned Anne's text, those of you who don't have it, Dan, you, you may not have been before when we talked about this this book. Is that clear? Can you see that? Yeah. Path to the Middle by Anne Klein. And I don't Jeff, have that one. Uh, so you can you can uh you know in your in your Italian bookstore you can you can buy that. Um Anne has been in co communication with us through Doris originally was sending emails asking her uh her take on it. Apparently, Anne, in, in her response, said that uh, unlike the the, the uh, excerpt from her book that is put in uh, Venerable Jones' translation that we'll be using later, there it said that it was translated by Jeffrey Hopkins. Anne said she translated all of the of the text here that we're reading, in addition to to Yeshi Tupton's commentary, but she also, uh, but Jeffrey Hopkins had translated the verses earlier, and she, they used those verses along with his annotations to those verses. So it should say that it was translated by Anne. Uh, the the bulk of the commentary in our text, in her text, is translated by Anne. And uh, the verses were translated by Jeffrey. This just came directly from uh, Anne's mouth, or you could say from her fingertips typing on the emails that she sent. Um, so the text continues, the condensed perfection of wisdom, which is another um, text that we will be quoting several times. This is uh, one of the famous very, very short texts on uh, the Prajnaparamita. So it doesn't mean one of the, you know, when we talk about the three mothers, we talk about the 100,000 verse, the 25,000 verse, the 8,000 verse. This is not one of those. This is a different situation, like the Heart Sutra and some other sutras that are called Prajnaparamita Sutras. This is one of the short ones. So it says, millions and billions of blind people bereft of sight, ignorant of the roads, 
how can they reach the towns? <laughs> Without wisdom, these five perfections, lacking sight, cannot touch awakening. Or uh, Anne's translation, how could billions of blind and guideless persons, okay, it's kind of like the, you know, you imagine in India, one of these big festivals when there are all of these people going to the Ganges or something. If there's a group of them that are blind, how could they get to the Ganges by themselves? They need to have someone to guide them, right? How could billions of blind and guideless persons, not even knowing the path, how could they enter the city without the perfection of wisdom, these five sightless perfections? So the implication meaning here, perfection meanings, the practice without the perfection of wisdom, without being conjoined with them. How could they, uh, without the perfection of wisdom, these five sightless perfections lack a guide and thus cannot reach enlightenment. So unless you have the perfection of wisdom, the other five perfections themselves don't create the karma to achieve enlightenment directly by themselves. Okay, makes sense. It's, it's very similar to the similar the 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 previous verse. So then, a quotation from the Vajra Chetika, which both translate as the diamond cutter, and I, I, I've you've probably remember my my uh, discussion of this before in it. it in Sanskrit, it's not called the diamond cutter. It's called the Vajra cutter. And uh, it's only called the Diamond Sutra in uh, when it was translated into Chinese. The, and the Chinese decided to call it the Diamond Sutra. They don't call it the diamond cutter. But because of that, people have gotten used to, to calling it the diamond cutter, as both Anne and Jimpa translate uh, nowhere in any of the commentaries to that uh, is there the word diamond. Um, it, 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 when it went in Kamala Shila's commentary to the Vajra Cutter, the, the Vajra Chetika, uh, he, he sort of may ask, asks parenthetically, why is it called the Vajra Cutter? Because it's big in the beginning small in the middle and big in the end you know like a vajra you know what the vajra looks like sort of a, sort of like a the instrument that you hold uh, that is uh i only have my blessed blessed one here which i won't show you uh it's sort of shaped uh sort of like a big ball at one end a big ball in the other with prongs on it and then something connecting them to it's sort of indicating symbolizing the union of method and wisdom or the union of the five perfections, which are method, with the perfection of wisdom. So in the Vajra Cutter, Jimpa's translation uh, translates, a person with sight who steps into the dark will not see anything. Right? Yeah, yeah. Even if you have eyesight, you step into the dark room. Uh, what was it? Like Jodie Foster, Foster in the and <laughs> the silence of the lambs, you know, going into the dark room, the lights were turned off, you can't see anything. A person with sight who steps into the dark will not see anything. So too, view the bodhisattva, you should view the bodhisattva in that same way, who has fallen into grasping at real entities while engaging thoroughly in generosity. What does that mean? That means that person, that bodhisattva who has fallen into grasping at real realities. That means they haven't realized emptiness. They are grasping that phenomena uh, truly exist the way that they appear as inherently existent, right? Uh, they will not see anything. So too, the Bodhisattva who has fallen into grasping at real realities while engaging thoroughly in generosity. They may think they see things, but they don't th see things the way they are. O Subhuti. So this is Buddha talking to Subhuti, uh, one of the bodhisattvas. O Subhuti, it is like this. It is thus. 
when day breaks and the sun shines, the person with eyes will see all the varied forms, unlike the, the person with sight who goes into the dark room. When there's light, they will see all the varied forms. So too, view the bodhisattva who has not fallen into grasping at real, at real entities while engaging thoroughly in generosity. All right, make sense? What are you thinking? Anyone? Let me see, I'm trying to find Anne's page. So uh, Anne translates uh, from the Vajra Cutter, or she translates Diamond Cutter, a bodhisattva who gives gifts upon falling into misapprehending things such as the gift, the giver, and the recipient as inherently existent. So she puts in parentheses that qualification. That means they've fallen into things or misapprehending things as inherently existent. Should, for example, be viewed like a person with eyes who sees nothing upon having entered into darkness. Subhuti, it is this way. A bodhisattva who not having fallen into such misapprehension of things, gives gifts, should be viewed as like a person with eyes who, when the sun shines at dawn, sees varieties of forms. Okay? What are you thinking? KT, where are you? Are you still here? Oh, KT is, is off camera. Making sense? Okay. Anna, what do you think? Okay. Okay. You, you, had, you, had, you had to unmute in order to put your thumbs up. Okay, that's good. William, making sense? Quotation from the, the Vajra Cutter? Okay. Good enough. Okay. So there's another quotation. Oh no, that's it. So uh, Jimba's text, Jimba's translation of Lama Sankava says, the same applies to morality and so on. Or as, as Anne says, the same is also for ethics and so forth. So it's not just uh, in terms of generosity that lacks the wisdom of emptiness, also for morality patience, enthusiastic perseverance, and concentration. They all have to be conjoined with the wisdom it realizes emptiness. Okay, so next outline. Explaining suchness in terms of seeing profound dependent origination, or as Anne translates, explanation of suchness in which the profound dependent arising is seen. Explaining suchness in terms of seeing profound dependent origination. Okay, so this is the outline that we're going to be pursuing now that has five parts. Promising to explain the profound truth. Promise to explain the meaning of profound emptiness. To identifying those who are vessels for explaining the profound truth or as Ant says, identification of those who are vessels for, for an explanation of the profound meaning. Third, the, the way higher qualities ensue if suchness is explained, or how good qualities arise when it is explained to them. And fifth, the way in which suchness of dependent origination is expounded or how suchness of dependent ar arising is explained, expounded, explained. So that's the major part. The, the, first, the first four are just coming up right now. So first is the promise to explain the profound truth. So you remember when we talked about uh, texts in general, in Sanskrit, uh, they would always, at the beginning, the author would always have um, make a, 
some statement which would, could be construed as a promise to explain the text. Reason for that is that the whole, holy beings, when they make a promise, it's like engraved, engraved in stone, you know, they will keep it, unlike the promises that we ordinary beings make, you know. I'll be there for you, you know, or I will, you know, I will do this or that, which is kind of like either pressing your hand in the sand so it's there for a while and gets evaporated away, or it's uh, it's like writing in the air, you know, it's, it's, it's gone immediately. So the, the promise to compose is kind of like an indication that, that uh, the author uh, is taking this responsibility seriously and they, they will complete it. They will complete the book. So this, the, this section begins, one might ask, how is it, as stated above, that when the Bodhisattva on the sixth ground sees dependent origination, <clears throat> they see suchness of dependent origination in terms of merely this emerging from that. Remember that term that we talked about before, uh, as a result of this, uh, that arises, like the like the 12 links, or as Anne translates that section. Uh, she has a lot in parentheses here first that I think that's worth uh, mentioning. This is kind of parenthetical commentary to beginning this. First, Chandrakirti indicates that he himself cannot, on his own part, explain emptiness, the profound suchness of dependent arising. Can't do it by himself. He further points out that since scriptures on the topic are also so difficult, he can't even give an explanation based solely on scripture either. Kind of like extreme humility. You may remember uh, that Lama Tsongkhapa, when he petitioned Manjushri whether Chandrakirti was a reliable author, uh, Manjushri told Lama Tsongkhapa that Chandrakirti was a 10th level bodhisattva, you know, on the verge of becoming a Buddha, whose sole goal in taking rebirth was to uh, clarify Nargajuna's teachings. So he was completely reliable. But even Chandrakirti himself says, you know, that uh, since the scriptures that he, that um, he cannot on his own explain emptiness, nor can he, that he, uh, that since the scriptures on the topic are so difficult, he cannot give an explanation based solely on the scriptures either. Rather, he will, he will base his explanation on the more accessible writings of Nargajuna, Maybe, and adding to what Anne said here, accessible, maybe you would say uh, totally reliable teachings of Nargajuna, who himself saw emptiness. Why? Because he was prophesized by the Buddha to have seen emptiness. So you could completely depend on Nargajuna's explanation. So that's sort of her commentary before this verse uh, that Jimpa had said, one might ask, how is it as stated above that when the Bodhisattva on the sixth ground sees the dependent origination, he sees the suchness of dependent origination in terms merely of this emerging from that. So Anne's translation of that is, you said before in the first stanza of this chapter that when the sixth ground Bodhisattva sees dependent arising, uh, that Bodhisattva will see the suchness of, of arising of this particular phenomenon in dependence on that particular phenomenon. How is this? <laughs> to respond, the commentary says, so the commentary, what is the commentary here? Doris, what, what commentary is he referring to? The Majama. Oh, I'm. I. I. <laughs> you can say the the auto commentary. You say in English, Chandrakirti's old auto commentary. So he wrote the, the comment. 
Okay, so it's not talking about Jayananda or anyone else. It's talking about uh, talking about Chandrakirti. So Chandrakirti is quoted here, and not 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 exactly kind of paraphrasing. The nature of this is something that does not fall within the purview of those like us or like me, whose eyes of intelligence are entirely covered by the dense cataracts of ignorance. You know, cataracts, anyone here have cataract surgery? Daniel has had some. Don, you had also. No one else? Makes a big difference. I was... For years, I you know things were getting more and more. I couldn't couldn't see well. I had the cataract operations, and it was almost like uh, having a windshield washer on your screen, and the washers clean off the mud, and suddenly you can see, you know, sort of thing. So uh, we say the cataract of ignorance. Uh, in this case, um, one of our uh, FPMT. Uh, education office persons, o- Olga Planken had said that the, all of the translations would translate from here on now cataract as fall as sight with falling hairs, which is not not always the case. There is a Tibetan term uh, in, in well, rabrip in Sanskrit. You know the the Sanskrit for rabrip, John Tamira, uh, that that can mean faulty sight or distorted sight that sometimes refers to uh, floaters, you know, that that, that it's almost though you're seeing floating uh, a hair falling in front of you. But here uh, it's talking about lingtok, which is a different word, which actually means some kind of film or on the eye or uh, which is, referring to cataract. So cataract is the right word here. The nature of this, the perfection of wisdom, is something that does not fall within the purview of those like us, like like me, whose eye of intelligence are entirely covered by the dense cataracts of ignorance. So this is a very common uh, kind of analogy that's used. Um, Cataracts prevent you from seeing things clearly, and maybe in some cases prevent you from seeing it all. Like the doctors who there are doctors who go to Tibet and other countries, uh, third world countries, simply to do cataract operations. Maybe some of you know that, so that people can suddenly see. It does not fall however, within the purview of those abiding on the advanced grounds. It does fall, however, within the purview. So that means explanation of emptiness, emptiness itself, does fall within their purview, within their, you know, sphere of understanding, because they can see emptiness directly. It does fall, however, within the purview of those abiding on the advanced grounds, such as the sixth ground. Therefore, this is not something to be asked of someone like us. One should pose this question to the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas who are free of the cataracts of ignorance, whose eyes of intelligence are anointed with the salve that is the excellent vision of emptiness, which destroys the cataracts of ignorance. So I think the uh, sort of like the implication here is there's some kind of ointment or salve that you can put on the eye to remove that cataract of ignorance. Generally, that's, I don't know if there's any kind of physical salve or ointment that you can put on the eye to remove um, cataracts, but in the sense of like some layer, uh, like if you have a uh, something on your body uh, that has a, a, a pellicule, a sort of a, some, some surface thing covering something, you can put on something to eliminate that Okay, and translates that same one. That's that same stanza this way. The entity of that, what is that? Suchness of dependent arising, namely the emptiness of inherent existence. So the the entity of that, the emptiness, the entity of emptiness is not an object for us 
whose mental eye is completely covered by the thick cataracts of ignorance. It is an object for those who dwell on the higher grounds, the sixth and so forth. Also, also uh, is an object uh, for those who are Buddhists. Therefore, this question should not be put to us, you know, to explain emptiness. You should speak with just the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas whose mental eye Jimpa puts it plural, mental eyes or eyes of wisdom, um, whose mental eye is free from the dimming cataracts of ignorance because they have applied the eye medicine of the good perfection perception of emptiness that overcomes the cataract of ignorance. So uh, you could say they have undergone a cataract removal operation or that they have applied the good eye medicine uh, that removes from their mental consciousness the ignorance that is acting like a cataract that prevents them from seeing emptiness directly. Makes sense? What do you think? Ratio? Making sense? Yeah? Daniel, you've had cataract operation recently, or no? Or is it coming up? Two months ago. Two months ago. You can see better? Yeah, finally. After, you... two, year, after two years, I can read again. So can you, has it improved your wisdom? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact that you can read the books now, maybe it will indirectly in, 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 improve your oh, wisdom. I'm... You're hoping so. Rochelle, what do you think? I, I wanted to share that I do, whenever they talk about I, you know, not being able to see, oh. I have, a, you know, very, very bad eyesight. I have a problem. And anyway, long story. Yeah. But when there's a lot of times where I don't have my, my contacts that I see something and I do not know what it is. And I completely miss it. Like if I see a flower, I might think, oh, there's a ball, you know, there. Right. Or right, if right. I see what, so when they, when I get these analogies, I totally understand because I, and it's interesting because my mind cannot see the object because right. of, anyway, so just. Right, right, right. So there are different degrees of this. So say people who don't see emptiness at all, uh, there uh, you know, to explain about emptiness is futile because they don't they their their wisdom eye so to speak. We usually don't talk about two eyes of wisdom. We say the wisdom eye, like in in the deities, like White Tara, there is a third eye right on her forehead. Right. Also, Vajrayogini, other deities have a third eye uh, that corresponds to. Uh, Supposedly, the, the wisdom consciousness that realizes emptiness, that that's open now. So when you, uh, when you see directly, that's one thing. When you have a conceptual understanding of emptiness, you've eliminated the cataract partially. Here, the cataract of ignorance is not referring to the mental image. Remember, we said the mental image prevents you from seeing emptiness directly because it's dominating there in your mental consciousness. Here, the ignorance is talking about something else. It's not the cataract of ignorance. It's not talking about the mental images being uh, directly the cataract. Okay, so the commentary continues. The application of an eye ointment makes one's vision clearer, but it does not remove the eyes or let's say using modern parlance, if you have a cataract operation, it removes a film from the eyes uh, that has become clouded for various reasons, but it doesn't remove the eyes. So to remove the cataract of ignorance doesn't, doesn't mean that you have to remove consciousness at all. The application of an eye ointment makes one's vision clearer, but does not remove the eyes. Likewise, applying the ointment that is the vision of emptiness makes one's eyes of intelligence clearer, 
it does not remove one's eyes of gnosis. Gnosis is the, you know, the, the kind of wisdom, right? We, when we talk about it, you could also call it exalted wisdom. It does not um, remove one's eyes of exalted wisdom. So Anne translates that. So he, again, she has some parenthetical remark here. Since Chandrakirti is indicating that one should definitely ask such beings about perceiving suchness, it would be a mistake to conclude that in Chandrakirti's system, there is no mind perceiving suchness in meditative equipoise. So in other words, uh, Chandra Kurti is saying you should ask them. So that indicates that there that emptiness is something that can be perceived in meditative equipoise. The reason for pointing that out is that the some, even some Buddhists, even some that purport to be Madhyamakas, maybe even Prasangikas, say that emptiness is not an object that can be perceived, but it definitely, definitely is something that can be perceived. Hence, just as when eye medicine is applied, one's eyes become clearer. I remember when I was in Singapore teaching the last time, uh, one of the students gave me some eye drops to put in when I was having difficulty seeing, it cleared up my vision a little bit. So it's not like illuminating the, 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 uh, uh, the cataracts or the eyes. Uh, when eye medicine is applied, one's eyes become clearer, but the eyes are not extracted, right? And when you take when you do an eye, when you do a cataract operation, you don't extract the eye, you just extract the, the film over them. So by applying the eye medicine, which which itself is the perception of emptiness, perception of emptiness is kind of like an eye medicine, right? The, the, not to your physical eyes, to your wisdom eye. So by applying the eye medicine, which is the perfection, the perception of emptiness, the mental eye becomes clearer. The eye of exalted wisdom is not extracted. The, the, the eye of gnosis, the gnosis eye is not extracted. If you understand this, you will not be polluted by the bad view consisting of the deprecation that there is no exalted wisdom consciousness in a superior's meditative equipoise. Or as, as Chimpa says, if one understands this point, one will not be tainted by the pitfall, disparaging view that there exists no, no, no gnosis in the meditative equipoise of the Aryas. So what's that referring to? His note 291 says, here, Tsongkhapa is criti critiquing the views of some earlier Tibetan thinkers. This is what I just was mentioning a moment ago, which entails the denial of any form of mental phenomena, including even gnosis, with respect to the ultimate truth. So they said that ultimate truth is not something, these earlier thinkers, ultimate truth, emptiness, it's not something that can be perceived in meditative equipoise on emptiness. For these Tibetan thinkers, these earlier wrong Tibetan thinkers, meditative equipoise of the Aryas represents the state of total mindlessness, taking nothing to mind. Even Sakya Pandita, you know, not just Galupas say this, but Sakya Pandita also criticizes this standpoint in his text called Clarifying the Sage's Intent. And Jimpa puts in a little, how do you say, advertisement for his own translation, uh, which is, you know, some of the, the new texts from the his, his uh, wisdom organization, translating some of these seminal texts of the different traditions. Uh, he had translated Sakya Pandita's uh, texts called Clarifying the Sage's Intent. So you can probably find that in the uh, bibliography of Jimpa's texts if, you, if you'd like to get that volume. 
Okay, how are we doing? Making sense? David, are you making sense? Making sense to you? Karen is now sitting next to David on my screen. That's nice. Okay. <laughs> KT, making sense to you? You okay? You're off. Doris, are you okay? Everything okay. Richard, you're thinking to make a comment? Okay, it's, it's okay. Okay. So let's continue. Now, one might ask, don't sutras such as the mother and the ten grounds, the mother means, remember when we talked about uh, the perfection of wisdom sutras, we talked about the mother. Usually that means the three mothers, the 8,000, the 25,000, 100,000 verse Prajnaparamita that are all talking about the same discourse, just different degrees of elaboration about it. So now one might ask, don't the sutras such as the mother perfection of wisdom and the 10 grounds, the sutra and the 10 grounds that we quoted so much, don't they teach that bodhisattvas who engage in the perfection of wisdom see the suchness of dependent origination? So why don't you follow the script, the scriptures when you expound it? Or as... Um, and translates that same qualm or question. Question, does it not say in sutras such as the mother sutras, that is the perfection of wisdom sutras, um, and the sutra on the 10 grounds and so forth, doesn't it say that bodhisattvas coursing the perfection of wisdom see the suchness of dependent arising? Therefore, give an explanation, a, a explanation following scripture you know, those scriptures, rather than Nargajuna's treatise. So that's the point here. So why why do you want why do you want to go back to um why do you want to rely on Nargajuna's treatise rather than relying on the Prajnaparamitas itself? So Chandrakirti responds to that in Jimpa's translation, ascertaining the purport. Is that the right pronunciation? Purport? Purport? <laughs> Ascertaining the purport or the thought, the intention of the scriptures is also difficult. So someone like us cannot reveal suchness even by citing the scriptures. So that it means the intention of the scriptures is difficult. What they're talking about, you know, they're saying a lot of words, and if you if you just parrot those words, it doesn't, you know, you just read those words, it doesn't mean that you've realized what they're referring to, right? This statement is made from the perspective of teaching suchness independently by oneself. However, to indicate the treatises have been composed by authentic masters who can expound the scriptures without distortion and how, on the basis of these, one can ascertain the, the purport or the intention of the scriptures. The text says, the next karika, the next uh, stanza or verse of Chattrakirti's, the third verse of this sixth mind generation says, one who has realized the utterly profound truth through scripture and through reasoning as well was the noble Nargajuna. So I will expound here his tradition as it appears in his treatises. Okay, makes sense, right? He's going to rely because even the even quoting the Prajnaparamita Sutras is difficult to ascertain what they're getting at. He will explain emptiness following Nargajuna's treatise on the middle way. So that means the fundamental wisdom. That's the, when we talk about entering the Umala Jukpa, the, that's the name of the, of the text, the Majamaka Avatara. Entering the Majamaka means entering into uh, uh, Nargajuna's treatise on the middle way. So Anne translates that stanza, since with scripture as well as reasoning, Nargajuna taught 
how those six ground bodhisattvas realize the very profound doctrine. I, myself, meaning Chandrakirti, will speak in accordance with the system of the superior Nargajuna or, or noble Arya Nargajuna, or we say Arya Nargajuna, right? All, all just different words for the same thing. So Lama Sokapa translate uh, commentary says, like the Bodhisattvas on the sixth ground, one who has realized the utterly profound truth of emptiness was Arya Nargajuna, the noble Nargajuna. So that using calling him Arya means that he, it's it's meant to mean not just that he's superior to other people, but that he is an Arya being. He's realized emptiness directly, right? Therefore, just as the treatises of the noble Nargajuna present suchness, I, Chandrakirti, too, will expound here his tradition as it appears in his treatises. Okay, so far, okay, right? John, you, it, clear, right? Okay. One might ask, Lama Sukhava says, how did the Narga, how did the noble Nargajuna ascertain the meaning of the definitive scriptures? So here there's throwing in some new term, definitive scriptures. So you may know uh, that they're different. They're diff there, there are two terms that are talked about. We say the, the interpretable scriptures and the scriptures of definitive meaning or the definitive scriptures. That's what's being talked about here. From the Prasangika point of view, definitive scriptures are those that explain explicitly, directly, the meaning of emptiness. They're not beating around the bush. They're not just talking about how you develop generosity to create merit that can enhance it and so forth, but they're talking directly about emptiness. How did the noble Nargajuna ascertain the meaning of the definitive scriptures? This we know on the authority of the scriptures. And then he quotes the Lanka Avatara Sutra, the Des descent into Lanka Sutra. David, do you know what what episode that what is it? The de descent into Lanka. What's that talking about? That sutra. What is what is Lanka? Ron, can I ask you one question? Do you know what Lanka it refers to? Sh Sri Lanka, right? Means, what do we call it today? So it used to be called Ceylon, right? So there is an episode in the Hindu scriptures. So Vansh, what is that? What, what, what's taking place in the Hindu scriptures? On, um, um, the Ramayana? Ramayana. Uh, what, see, um, uh, uh, and Rama going to uh, Ceylon to uh, you know and uh, because Sita is there and Ravan has taken Sita Sita is someone's wife right uh, uh, she, she is Rama's wife and Rama's Ravan wife. has taken Sita right okay so there's episode there in Lanka but he, in the Lanka Vatara Sutra is not talking about that episode Lanka Vatara Sutra is talking about episode of Buddha uh, coming to Lanka a uh, very famous translation by D.T. Suzuki, one of the very first Mahayana sutras that was translated back in the, I don't know, 40s or 50s or 30s or something like that. Anyway, uh, there's a quotation uh, prophecy in the Lankavatara Sutra. Buddha saying this, in the south, in the land of coconuts, <laughs> uh, Let's see. Let me get Anne's translation here. It doesn't necessarily mean coconuts. That's how that's how uh, Jimpa has translated it. Uh, Anne says, "In the south, in the area of Vidarbha, Vidarbha. Anyway, in the in this in the south, in the land of coconuts, there will come a monk 
known as glorious. And did anyone know what glorious is in Sanskrit? Shri. Shri, right? Shri Kala Chakra, Shri Haruka, so forth. And so forth. Shri is, uh, in, in Tibetan we say Peldin. So in the Tibetan text it says there will, be, there will come a monk named Peldin that's referring to his name, his ordination name, right? It's not, it's not, not just saying that he is, he is glorious. Who will be called by the name Naga. He'll crush standpoints of existence and non-existence. He'll expound in the world my vehicle. So that's Buddha talking about this prophecy. He said, my vehicle, that means my Mahayana vehicle, the unsurpassed great vehicle, the unsurpassed Mahayana. So the Buddha also referred to his Hinayana, his lesser vehicle. He said, if you were to choose, you should follow my Mahayana rather than my Hinayana that were set out for various reasons, right? Um, accomplishing the ground of perfect joy, he'll depart to the pure land of Sukhavati. What's the ground of perfect joy? Anna, do you know? Which ground is that? Is that the third ground? Oh, it's the first ground, isn't it? First ground, the joyous. Oh, the path of seeing. Yeah, the path of seeing, first ground. So that prophecy says he was the first, he will become a first grounder. Other places, it says that he will be a sixth grounder. Some places say that he is, he attained the eighth ground, some that he attained the tenth ground, some that he attained Buddhahood and so forth. So kind of like, not quite clear what, you know, when the Bodhisattvas appear, uh, it's not clear from what they say and act what ground in such a, such a way like the Buddha did when he was born, like he was still an ordinary person. Whereas from the Mahayana point of view, he was already a Buddha, but he took the aspect of learning, going to school, learning the alphabet and, and reading and writing and uh, playing sports and everything like this, getting married. Um, so those can be kind of like... Uh, sort of like the action, the, you know, what, what do you call it? Sort of supposed actions. So uh, it may be that this is what Buddha is referring to. He will appear to have achieved the perfect, the, the first ground, the perfect joy. He'll depart to the pure land of Sukhavati. So that means when he dies, he will take rebirth in Sukhavati. Um, and translates that as in the south, in the area of Vidarbha, will be a, a monk known widely as Sriman. So Sri, the first part, is the glorious Sriman, who will also be called Naga, destroying the extreme positions of existence and non-existence. What, what are those two positions? So existence, extreme position of ex existence means that things truly exist, inherently exist, and the extreme position of non-existence means that phenomena don't exist at all. Okay, they are illusions. They're, they're not like illusions, they are illusions. He will thoroughly teach in the world the unsurpassed great vehicle, my vehicle. Having done this, he will achieve the very joyous ground and then go to the blissful pure land upon passing away, the Sukhavati pure land. John, you had a thought? No? Okay. You've rethought it. Okay. No, no, it was a, a mistake and button push. Sorry. Oh, okay. Got it. William, how are you doing? You're 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 not your usual uh you haven't interjected anything today. No, I don't want to disappoint you. I think the tail is a rope, and I think the side of the elephant is like a house, as I recall. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, getting back to the the blind people. Yeah, so the, the uh, side other of the than that, I have nothing to add. And the, and the tail was like a rope, right? As opposed to the the what's it called the, the elephant snout? What is it called? The trunk. Uh, can't remember what it's called. So that's trunk. like trunk, trunk, or trumpa, trunk. as we say, trumpa, trumpa Rinpoche, the trunk, Mister Trunk. 
<laughs> trunk. Okay. Okay. So this is one quotation. So there are several prophe prophecies of Nargajuna coming that the Buddha made. And this is the first one that, that Chandrakirti mentions here uh, in the Lankavatara Sutra, one of the famous ones, uh, that he will come, um, he will uh, expound my great vehicle, and uh, so forth and so on. So continuing, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa says, thus it was stated, you could say it was prophesied that Nargajuna will expound the definite vehicle, the definitive vehicle. Um, in fact, Anne's translation says, thus Buddha said that Nargajuna would comment on the definitive vehicle. When we talk about the definitive or interpretable, that means the, the vehicle that includes within it definitive scriptures that explain about emptiness. Doesn't mean the whole vehicle is talking about emptiness. The Mahayana also talks about um, the method side, which is not definitive, um, free from the extremes of existence and non-existence. And then um, Jim, uh, Jimba's translation says, this prophecy refers to the Lichavi youth, Loka Priya Darshana, a contemporary of the Buddha, mentioned in the sublime Golden Light Sutra. So some of you have recited the Golden Light Sutra on many occasions. The FPMT has prayerathons, the Golden Light Sutra, who would later take birth as Nargajuna. So what's this talking about? Um, Anne's translation says, he is a rebirth of a Lichidi youth. So that was a, a location in India known as, uh, Jimpa puts the, the Sanskrit here, Loka Priya Darshana. So Loka means world. Priya means what? Like, likable. And Darshana means uh, seeing. So she just translates it as uh, known as he who is liked when seen by all. You know, so everyone who sees this guy likes him. You know, it's just this like wonderful personality. What wonderful, uh, what do you say, aura. He is a rebirth of the Lachiti youth known as liked when seen by all the world, all in the world, during the time of the teacher Buddha who is mentioned in the excellent golden light sutra uh the great uh, yeah okay so that's that's where we're going to uh stop today we'll just mention this next verse there's a quotation from the great cloud sutra so uh there are two sutras that uh associated uh, these two coming sutras the great cloud sutra and the great drum sutra were supposedly recovered also by Nargajuna. Um, so they are great, considered to be Mahayana, uh, reliable Mahayana sutras. So this sutra that we're, that we're going to just read it now, we'll comment on it next time. The Great Cloud Sutra states, uh, another prophecy of Nargajuna, when it has been 400 years after my death, this youth will become a monk known by the name of Naga, and will propagate my teachings. So the named, uh, going by the name Naga means Nar Nagarjuna, right? Nagarjuna. Finally, he will become a king named Gyana Kara Prabha in the realm known as utterly transparent light. So she <laughs> makes this, translating some of them in into English and some of leaving in Sanskrit, as, as Anne translates, 400 years after I, Shakyamuni Buddha, passed from sorrow, that is, dies, this youth, like when seen by all in the world, will become a monk known as Naga and will disseminate my teaching. Finally, in the land called Very Pure Light, I'm not sure why, why, 
utterly transparent light in the in the in the land called utterly pure light he will become a conqueror named light which is the source of all wisdom that's what jimpa has jnana kara prabha so with this talking about the buddha was in the presence of various people and there was a, a young boy this one who is liked by all in the world when it's seen uh who had asked some questions and made some statements about wanting to you know become a bodhisattva buddha in the future and the buddha prophesied that in the future he would become um what did he say here become a monk known as uh, naga and will disseminate my teaching and um then he prophesizes in the future when Nargajuna will become a Buddha sometime in the very uh, vast future. That doesn't mean he didn't be, achieve Buddhahood before then. That means when he will become a universal teacher of Buddha, right? Like, like Shakyamuni Buddha had achieved Buddhahood eons before he came to earth and turned the wheels of Dharma. It was so when we say he 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 will become a Buddha is kind of in, in that sense. So we're going to end there for today. How are we doing? Any uh, any questions? Uh, clarifications that are needed? Diana Weddington, are you doing okay? Diana Abramo? Everything clear? Okay. Rocio's meditating. Anna's writing. There was a there was a photo. I hope it will be put up sometime. When Geshe taught this sixth chapter, uh, Doris was able to find on the Deer Park Park website some photos that were taken. And there's one in the in the old temple with Geshe teaching this very section we're talking about. And there's Lama Zopa off to the side, some other monks and nuns. And there's I, I, everyone else is listening to Geshe and I'm writing like like Anna is doing. Uh, it's sort of all these books in front of me. I, I like to put that up. When I was at Kopan, when we were studying Abhidharma Kosha, I think I told you, I couldn't get all of the books on my little puja table in front of me when Geshe Jampa Gatsu was teaching Abhidharma Kosha. So I bought a piece of wood and I had it milled out that that went over the, the, the length of the puja table, about a foot and a half on each side. I, the people in the class called it my wings. So I had the Chandra got look uh, Chandra Das's dictionary, the big old edition. John will probably know. Maybe some of you have seen that you'd buy it at uh, Locus Chandra or wherever it was. It, it, the place I can't remember the name in in Delhi. Big thick dictionary, and then on the other side, other books and my notebooks and everything like that. So uh, yeah, there's different traditions. Some just like some of you are just listening. Not taking notes. Some of you are taking notes. Some of you are extremely taking notes. <laughs> Different kinds of traditions. So um, we're going to end there. That's where we'll start next time. Um, Karen or Doris, whoever has the dedication prayers, if you'd like to put up and the long life prayer and the prayer for the quick. Is it? You notice that that looks like a peacock feather, right? Okay, so may the venerable lama's life be firm. Oops, what happened? We had that. That was okay. <laughs> may the venerable lama's life be firm. Their white divine actions spread in the ten directions. So, for instance, when we talk about uh, the, the female teacher, Chisuma, who was teaching recently, uh, you don't have to say his, say her, her white divine action spread in the ten directions. May the torch of the teachings of Losang also always remain, dispelling the darkness of all beings in the three realms. And then, um, are there some dedication prayers? There we go. So you can think, due to these virtues, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha. Why do we say Guru Buddha, not Buddha? Because in the sense of uh, always, all of these prayers are 
in the Mahayana sense of the essential practice of guru devotion. So the a guru Buddha, all gurus are, are to be seen as Buddhas. All Buddhas are to be seen as gurus. May I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings, all migrators without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme precious Buddhachitta you don't have to say jewel bodhicitta, precious bodhicitta, that has not arisen, may it arise and grow in my continuum due to these merits that we've created. And may that which has already arisen, whatever semblance of bodhicitta I have, not diminish, but increase more and more. And then prayer for the swift return of Lama Sopa Rinpoche, peerless teacher and assembly of children of the conquerors, Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas, victorious Losang, referring to Losang Drakpa, Lama Sonkapa, You're, you are the spiritual father along with your two sons, Gelsub Jay and Kedrup Jay, together with your lineage, all the objects of refuge of the infinite lands. Please now, right now, bestow the virtue and goodness to accomplish this prayer. In holding and spreading the Muni's precious and complete teachings through explanation and practice, you, Lama Sopa, wore the armor of patience, Sopa, that is never discouraged, incomparable, venerable Guru. To you I make this request. Soul gateway through which all benefit and happiness emerge while striving exclusively for the welfare of the victorious one's teachings and while striving for mother sentient beings, you suddenly departed to peace. At this, I lost hope. Never, nevertheless, through the undeceiving truth of the blessings, the oceanic blessings of the three jewels and the waves of mind generation, of bodhicitta of the bodhisattvas, the children of the conquerors, may the smile of a new reincarnation swiftly beam in glory for we for us fortunate disciples. And then for all of our spiritual friends, you who are eyes for my, my viewing of all the infinite scriptures, you are, you are my eyes that allow me to view them, supreme gateway for the fortunate ones traveling to liberation, engaging as you do with skillful means, moved by mercy, all illuminating spiritual friends, please live a long and stable life. And then seal that conventional dedication in the emptiness of the three spheres as much as you can, recognizing, you know, re revivifying in your mind that, that dedication, the merits that I've created today, in the past, in the future, May they all lead to my eventual achievement of enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. Along the stages of the path, practicing the Bodhisattva Bhumis, first having developed renunciation, Buddhicitta, and wisdom, and so forth, all the subsidiary realizations, collecting, accumulating the two collections, leading up to that goal for the benefit of sentient beings, all of those elements are empty of an inherent existence. The virtues that I've created, whether they be the collection of merit or wisdom, somehow I have a mental image of them. I'm doing something and I have an, an idea that I've created some merits. To our minds, those merits and those collections of wisdom appear to have seem to us as having some kind of natural, inherent existence from their own side. They are merely imputed by the mind. They do exist conventionally. They function. They do bring about their goals, but they are merely imputed. The goals dedicated to my achievement of realizations, ascending the bhumis, achievement of enlightenment, and so forth, all of those in my mind's eye, I can imagine, in some form, but what I imagine is always mixed with the appearance of inherent existence, which prevents me from realizing 
what those goals actually are like. They are mere names given to appearances in the world, which do function, because those goals do function, becoming Buddha and so forth, making realizations, but they're empty of any inherent existence at all. And the act of dedication, trying to link these virtues with those results, that process, like walking, taking steps, is merely a name we give to something. It can't be located anywhere within that. It's empty of inherent existence, but still functions conventionally. Sealing the dedication and the emptiness of the three spheres, as you know, helps to protect them from being destroyed by anger and disparaging bodhisattvas, abandoning the Dharma and so forth. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll have a uh, discussion group on Monday. Uh, those of you who haven't had a chance to come in the past might drop in sometime. And I'll see you next uh, Saturday. Please read ahead. We uh, go over what we talked about. And those who, who didn't take notes were trying to understand, try to re recall. Um, and uh, if you don't have, if you can't remember, if you didn't take notes, you can eventually get the recording and go back to those sections. See you next week. Take care. Be good. Venerable George, thank you. Thank you, Venerable George. I, I hope you, you none of you experience this hurricane that's coming up the East Coast. Take care. Thanks, Karen. Anytime. My apologies for my